All right, so today's topics uh, today's topic is uh, lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, since we're mostly talking about uh, injury cases, most of the stenosis will be due to a disc herniation. That's the most common way to get stenosis in your lumbar spine uh, as a result of an injury. It's typically not going to be a chronic stenosis or instability that we that will be separate topic. All right, so um, basic anatomy of lumbar of the spine, you have cervical, thoracic, and lumbar portions. Obviously, lumbar spine is at the very bottom, comprised of five vertebrae with discs and joints between them. So the, 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 the bones are connected by the discs in the front and facet joints in the back. The discs carry about 50% of the weight. The facet joints usually carry about 20% of the weight. In lumbar spine, your vertebrae are going to be the largest because they carry more body weight than your neck or your middle back would. Uh, lumbar spine is also uh, fairly mobile. Cervical spine is mobile as well, but because there's uh, less load on it, it's actually less prone to injury. So lumbar spine is definitely the most prone to injury portion of the spine. Uh, so anatomy of each of the vertebrae, you have the large vertebral body in the front and you have the posterior bones in the back. The pedicles is what connects the vertebral bodies to the facet joints. And then the lamina is not a structural bone, but more serves as a protection for the nerves in the middle of the canal, uh, as well as uh, serves as attachment for paraspinal muscles. The transverse processes on the sides also serve as attachment for uh, paraspinal muscles. And the big hole in the middle uh, is the spinal canal. So if you stack a bunch of vertebrae together, you're gonna create basically a tunnel, which is a spinal canal through which the nerves uh, go down and then exit the vertebra, uh, exit the uh, spine at each level to do what they need to do. So the disc is not a solid structure. It actually has two components. You have the soft inner portion called nucleus pulposus. That's what does most of the cushioning. And then you have the tough outer portion, which, called, which is called annual fibrosis. That's what contains the disc um, and also connects the vertebra together. So that's more of a structural connective tissue not really doing much cushioning. And then, of course, you have a bunch of ligaments, anterior, posterior ligament of flavum, interspinous ligament, supraspinous ligament. All those are multiple ligaments that connects the bone to connect the bones together in addition to your disc and the facet joint. Uh, those ligaments obviously protect the spine from being from moving too much. And all those ligaments obviously are at risk of being injured if there's some kind of an impact to the spine. And then all of that is covered by muscles. There are multiple muscles, uh, superficial and deep, that connect to the vertebra and basically are responsible for both moving the spine as well as stabilizing the body. And um, all of that is um, basically the bones and the, ner uh, and the uh, muscles um, kind of protect, house, and allow the nerves to function. So your spinal cord form forms from the brain stem and it goes through the cervical spinal canal, then through the thoracic spinal canal. In lumbar spine, the spinal cord ends at the top of the lumbar spine, and then you just have loose nerves going through the spinal, the spinal canal called cauda equina because it looks like a horse tail. Um, and then, as you can see, at each level, the nerves exit the spinal canal, and they basically go on and do what they need to do. The nerves that exit your spinal canal in the lumbar spine control your uh, basically function of your legs. Uh, so when a disc herniation happens, it can happen in the center and compress all the nerves in the center. It can happen slightly off to the side called paracentral or lateral recess to know the disc herniation. That's probably the most common. Uh, then you can have a foraminal and far lateral disc herniations. Those are less common, but can actually be more painful because that's where the dorsal root ganglion is. They can be compressed and it's basically the most tender portion of the nerve. So the difference between the nerves in the spine versus peripheral nerves, peripheral nerves, which are basically the nerves that uh, run up our legs and uh, arms, uh, are very well protected. So you have the, the axons, the basically the nerve cells that actually carry the signals, but then they are protected by a layer of endoneurium. Then there is a layer of uh, intrafascicular perineurium and then epineurium on top of that. So basically there are three layers of connective tissue that uh, uh, protect the actual nerve fibers from compression. So for example, most of us at some point hit our funny bone. When you hit the funny bone, the part that gives you the numbness and tingling down the arm is actually not hitting the bone itself, but it's hitting the ulnar nerve that goes around that funny bone. 
So we literally can hit that nerve. The nerve doesn't like it. So you feel that tingling, but then it goes away. Um, and the nerve can easily recover and does not get damaged every time we hit our finding bone because the peripheral nerves are so well uh, protected. They have so many layers of protective connective tissue around them. In the spine, it is a very different story. You basically don't have any protection. You have the pure nerve tissue that is connected, uh, that is uh, surrounded by a very thin layer of uh, endoneurium. And therefore, the nerve roots in the spine are much, much more sensitive to pressure than a peripheral nerve root. So for example, if you would hit a spinal nerve root with the same force that you would typically hit your funny bone, that nerve root will be permanently damaged. There's no way for it to recover because it is not protected. It doesn't really need to be protected, technically speaking, because the spine, the actual bones protected. So as long as nothing else within the spine hurts it, the nerve should be okay. However, that's where the disc herniations come in. That's why disc herniations can affect the nerves so badly, even if they compress them a little bit, because the nerves are not really protected and are very vulnerable to pressure. So spinal stenosis, basically the definition of spinal stenosis is narrowing of the spinal canal. So normal spinal canal, the, here you, they show the uh, spinal cord within the canal. There should be room around the nerves within the canal. But if this disc herniates down, they can compress the nerve. If the soft tissue around the back starts growing in, they can also compress the nerves. And whenever the room for the nerve is smaller than what it's supposed to be, that's what spinal stenosis is. So um, causes of spinal stenosis, the main one we're gonna be talking about today, like I said, would be lumbar disc herniation. That's probably the most common. Um, in terms of nomenclature, how you call a disc herniation, it can be called bulging, it can be called protrusion. There's really no strict definition of where the disc bulging ends and disc herniation begins. Unfortunately, those nerves are, those terms are used interchangeably. So you gotta be very careful um, you can't just say, well, if it's bulging, it's not a big deal. If it's a herniation, it's a big, big deal because they actually are the same thing. It's a matter of who is calling it what. Uh, so you more uh, need to concentrate on how badly the nerve is herniated, meaning how big it, the herniation is and how badly it is actually compressing the nerves. Other causes of spinal stenosis are degenerative stenosis, just from wear and tear in the spine, spondylolisthesis. That's when you have instability and the bones start shifting and pitch the nerves. You can have congenital stenosis. Some people are born with a spinal canal that is already narrower than it should be. You can have epidural lipomatosis, which is overgrowth of fat tissue inside a spinal canal. And then obviously trauma, if you have a fracture in the spine, the bone can create stenosis and compress the nerves. And rarely, but you can have tumors grow in the spinal canal and also compress the nerves. But the one we're gonna be talking today, obviously, is um, lumbar disc herniation. So lumbar disc herniation, typically cause, is caused by acute physical stress, which can be either compression on that disc or a shear force in the disc that forces that nucleus pulposus, the soft portion, to rip through the annulus and basically protrude into the spinal canal. The wall of the annulus around the nerves is thinner than the wall of the annulus anywhere else. So whenever the disc herniates, it typically herniates in the back where the nerves are. Um, you can also get a herniation from subacute repetitive stress. That would be, that's what I usually see in my uh, work injury patients. Uh, but in either case, the nucleus breaks through the annulus and can either protrude a little bit and only cause kind of bulging out of the annulus, but not really escape. It can escape completely and kind of you can have a hole through the annulus. It can escape to the point, not only there's a hole through the annulus, but the disc actually protrudes through the hole. And you can have what's called extruded fragment or free fragment where part of that nucleus ripped through the hole in the annulus, escaped, and is now actually not even connected to the rest of the disc in the disc space. So this is what an MRI would look like of a normal spine versus the one with a herniated disc. So here you see this is L5S1 disc that is normal on the leftmost side of the screen. And then if, as the disc herniates, you now have less disc between the bone. And now that disc is sitting here behind the bone and compressing the nerves that run behind the bone over here. Uh, the, on the right side of the screen, you see the axial view. That's kind of a top and down, looking at the vertebra from the top. So the, you have the larger arterial body. Behind it, you see the spinal canal and the gray little dots of the nerves. That's how much room they're supposed to have. And then on the rightmost side of the screen, you see what happens when it disc herniates, and now it's compressing all of those nerves, not really giving them much room. 
All right, so what are the signs and symptoms of a lumbar disc herniation? Obviously, first sign we usually see is pain in the lower back or the legs. A lot of times patients start having pain in the back only and the leg pain starts later. Uh, initially, the nerve is able to compensate and it doesn't really send the signals of pain down the leg, but the longer the nerve is compressed, the more inflammation you have, the more likely you start having pain in the leg. So just because you did not get leg pain right away does not mean you don't have a coronated disc. It may just may mean that the leg pain will start later, or in some cases, coronated discs only cause low back pain and actually do not cause less leg symptoms as well. Um, when the nerve gets compressed, you can get what's called neurologic symptoms, which are numbness, which means you don't feel things very well. The nerve is compressed, therefore the signals going up through the nerve to the brain are not getting to the brain very well, so you don't feel as much with your leg or your foot. You can have tingling where instead of normal sensation, you have abnormal sensation in there and you're feeling things that are not really there. We can actually have hypersensitivity, meaning the leg is actually more sensitive to touch and even normal touch becomes painful. Uh, if you compress the nerve more, then you start compressing the motor fibers inside the nerve. And those are the ones that are responsible for sending signals from the brain to the muscles in the leg to move. So if you compress the nerve bad enough, those signals are not getting through. So you start getting weakness in the leg. That's the classic foot drop that people are talking about. That's when you can't really lift your foot because the muscle that tries to lift it is not getting signal from the nerve anymore because the nerve is compressed. And now the foot flops and cannot lift up anymore. Cauda syndrome is when all the nerves in the spinal canal are completely compressed uh, to the point that even the nerves that control your bowel and bladder function are compressed and you start having incontinence. That's potentially devastating, but very rare uh, circumstance. If cauda happens, if you start having bowel or bladder control problems, you need to have surgery within 48 hours. Otherwise, there's a very high chance it will be permanent. Um, a lot of people with disc herniations cannot sit or stand for a long period of time. You will see them fidgeting. They constantly have to reposition. That's one of the classic signs. Basically, they're trying to adjust their body to try to move that nerve away from the disc as much as possible. Um, a lot of people, when they have herniated disc, it hurts more to bend forward than it is to bend backwards because you're compressing the disc more as you bend forward. And they have what's called positive straight leg raise. When you straighten the leg out, you stretch the sciatic nerve in the back of the leg that sciatic nerve is connected to the nerve roots in the back. So as you pull on the sciatic nerve, you pull on those nerves, those nerves are already being compressed by the disc. If you pull on those nerves more, you compress them by the disc more, and you start having even more shooting pain down the leg. So kind of positive straight leg raise or pain down the leg when you straighten the leg out is one of the signs that you have a herniated disc. Typically, it's diagnosed by history and physical exam. Uh, a lot of things that a patient will tell me will make me think, okay, this is probably a disc herniation. Physical exam findings will con uh, um, typically confirm it. And then to finally confirm it, we typically would get an MRI um, more just to confirm, yes, this, this truly is a herniated disc, and to also let me know exactly where that disc is herniated and how badly it's herniated, and then decide what we need to do about it. Uh, patients who cannot get an MRI, if they have like a pacemaker or some other metal implant in them that cannot, that is not MRI compatible, then the CT myelogram is the test we do on those patients where we do a CT scan, but they first have to inject some dye in the spinal canal so we can see the nerves and herniated disc. It's a little bit more complicated than MRI. It involves radiation, it involves somebody sticking a needle in patients' back. So we typically don't do it unless there is no way to get an MRI because like I said, they have a pacemaker or something like that. All right, so treatment options for lumbar disc herniations. Most of them are treated non-surgically. Majority of disc herniations eventually do go away by themselves. We probably operate on about 10% of them. Um, but So basically the main goal of treatment for a lumbar disc herniation is to keep the patient comfortable, decrease their symptoms, decrease inflammation while we're waiting for their body to actually resorb that herniated disc. Um, so we um, recommend rest, but only for a short period of time. I do not want a patient to be on bed rest for two months while waiting for the disc to improve, because then the actual inactivity will cause more harm than good. Um, the muscles will decondition, um, and they'll actually be in more pain. It'll take longer to recover. So I only recommend resting for first couple of days, maybe, but then start active treatment and mobilization as soon as possible. Anti-inflammatory medications like Motrin or Relief are very helpful. If the inflammation is really bad, sometimes we give oral steroids, but that's pretty rare. 
Uh, if the pain is worse, then uh, they can have stronger pain medication as well as muscle relaxants. Um, and almost inevitably, I would recommend for a patient to have either chiropractor treatment or physical therapy as kind of a first line of treatment for a lumbar disc herniation. A lot of times those treatments do alleviate the symptoms and then patient can actually recover. If they don't get better with chiropractor treatment or physical therapy, then the next step is an epidural injection. That's when we inject steroid in, uh, right near the nerve instead of just taking steroid by mouth, that way you can concentrate it around the nerve a lot more. Um, and that can help with pain a lot. Some uh, typically patients need between one or three injections. Sometimes it takes up to three. Usually if the three injections didn't help, the fourth one is not gonna help. So don't really bother with that. Uh, but basically the goal of epidural steroid injection is to decrease inflammation around the nerve. Whenever the disc herniates and pushes on the nerve, there's a lot of inflammation in that area. If you decrease it, they'll feel better. Uh, there's a little bit of misconception. Some people um, think that an epidural injection will actually remove the herniated disc. That is not true. The steroid doesn't do anything to remove the disc. You're just making somebody feel comfortable and buying their body time to uh, either resorb that disc or for the nerve to get used to being pushed on and the symptoms go away. But basically, the thing to remember, epidural steroid injection treats symptoms. It does not treat the root cause. It will not make the disc herniation go away any faster. Uh, but if you keep somebody comfortable and give them time, that discrimination, like I said, 90% of the time will go away on its own. And then obviously, if none of those things help, that's when we start thinking about surgery. Surgery is a definitive treatment that will definitely solve a problem because you go in there and physically remove the herniated disc, get the pressure off the nerves. Um, so it will help definitely, but obviously it is surgery. It's much more involved, much more expensive. There are greater risks involved with surgery than with any other treatments, so we typically keep it as a last resort. And like I said, with typical disc herniations, only maybe 10% of people or uh, we will, will at some point need surgery. Majority of people, 90%, will get better without it. Uh, chiropractic treatments, obviously, you guys know about those a lot more than I do, but it involves manipulations. Um, there are a lot of various decompression and distraction maneuvers that can be done. And there are also multiple modalities that can be done for uh, pain and spasms, heating baths, TENS units, electrical stimulation, dry needling, things like that. Uh, physical therapy typically involves um, uh, extension exercises uh, or McKenzie protocol, which is a set of exercises which involve mostly extension of the spine. When you extend your spine, you create a little bit more negative pressure in the disc, so it can move the disc away from the nerve a little bit. Um, and you also concentrate on core strengthening, range of motion, and help them with pain and spasms. Like I said, you know, it doesn't really make the disc herniation go away. It just makes you feel better and make sure you're not deconditioned while we're waiting for the body to recover and for the disc to get resorbed. <laughs> Epidural steroid injections, like I said, decrease inflammation around the nerves. They can help both with the pain down the leg as well as pain in the back. Uh, there are two types of inter, uh, um, epidural steroid injection. Intralaminar is done in the middle of the spinal canal, and you basically inject it, and the fluid spreads up and down the spinal canal about uh, four levels or so, so it covers a much wider area, but because of that, the medication gets diluted, so it, while it covers a much greater area, the concentration of medication at any one spot is not that great, so uh, the intralaminar injection is kind of equivalent of a shotgun blast. You cover a wide area, but each pellet, so to speak, is not that powerful. Transforaminal injection, which is probably what you guys see most commonly, is actually more effective. That's more like a sniper shot, where instead of going in the middle of the spinal canal, you go off to the side in the foramen, so the medication stays in one area, and you concentrate around the uh, compressed nerves, so it actually works stronger and usually lasts longer. So most of the time, if you see an injection done, it will be transforaminal injection. And then another name for it is a selective nerve root block. That's probably not one you've seen in the charts. Uh, either way, it does need to be done under fluoroscopy. Epidural injections can be done blind, but obviously bad things can happen if the needle goes too far. So most of the time, 99.9% in, in of the time, you will see those done under x-rays. So the uh, pain management doctor will watch the needle go into the right spot and make sure it's in the right spot before they start injecting. Uh, it can be done with or without sedation. It's a little bit of a patient preference. Some patients don't mind being awake during these and you can't tolerate them being awake. It's an injection. It's not super painful. Majority of people in this area do choose to be sedated so they don't really feel that they're kind of asleep when it happens. 
Uh, chance of complications for epidural injections is very low. I think it's about five in 100,000, so it's much, much less than 1%. Um, uh, fairly common thing to do, obviously done very frequently. Um, the only thing to keep in mind, if somebody's diabetic, it will make their blood sugar go up. A little bit of steroid will get into the bloodstream, so we just warn patients with diabetes to watch their blood sugar for the first couple of weeks, uh, and after that, everything should normalize. Uh, I typically recommend uh, in, uh, doing injections up to three times per spot per year. Doing more than that is typically not effective and potentially can be harmful. If you inject enough steroid in one area, you can actually cause soft tissue breakdown and complications. So that, you know, um, when I said very low risk of complications, that's assuming that, in the, you know, one spot is not injected more than three times per year. Uh, the cost of injection, if you take everything into account, anesthesiologist fee, the facility fee is usually what I've seen in the charts between 10 and 15,000. Doc, can I ask a question? Yes. About the injections. So I was at a conference about two weeks ago, and there was a surgeon that was there talking about injections. And he brought up something that I had never heard anybody say before. And I refer for injections quite a lot. So it was important mm -hmm. when he said it. He said, when they do an injection, that there's a little bit of residual that is left around the area where they do the injection. And he referred to it as like a, a like a whiteout almost that it's on there. And he said, over time, it's detrimental and it does affect it down the road should they choose to become a surgical candidate. So he said, next time you talk to one of your pain docs, have them give you the bottle and look at the residual that's in there. So given that I do refer for them a lot, and this was something I had never heard before, I figure this is like a minimal risk unless you're dealing with an incompetent pain doc. So talk to me a little bit about that when it comes to you, the, the surgical aspect of it, what you see after the fact. Sure. So um, majority of the time, that is incorrect. Majority of the time, you don't really see the residual unless they've been getting those injections for years. Okay. So there are two types of uh, steroids that they can put in there. Some do have the um, kind of particulate in them, not completely dissolved steroid. Some inject only steroids that are fully dissolvable. So when you have that residual is when a uh, pain management doctor decided to use a steroid that has a little bit of particulate um, sediment in it, which is basically that same steroid, but not fully dissolved. The goal of that, at least the uh, the theory behind it is that it stays around longer, it gets released over a longer period of time, so it helps for a longer period of time than a steroid that can be fully dissolved and there's no residual left. Okay. Uh, and he is correct. If somebody, I typically see it in elderly patients who've been getting epidural steroid injections for like 10 years. Okay. There will be enough accumulation of that plaque in there that that plaque can potentially sit on the dura and make the dura stick to other things. So during surgery, you, go, you have a higher likelihood of a dural tear. Um, yeah, that's uh, what he was talking so, about. Yeah, exactly. So, but like I said, it's pretty rare. I mean, almost every laminectomy or marked discectomy I do or any spine surgeon does is being done after somebody has already tried an epidural steroid injection and it didn't work. So if okay. this was true that every time a steroid injected it, inject it, it weakens the dura, then everybody would be doing surgery on, you know, a huge amount right. of them would be getting dural tears and obviously we don't. So you only see that if they've been doing it for years. So on my young one-off patient that I'm convincing that this is what they need to do, I do not have to feel guilty for that. I mean, no, you should not feel guilty. Okay. Everything we do in medicine does have risk and benefit involved in it. So you offer a treatment when you think the benefits of the treatment uh, outweigh the risk, right? I mean, okay. yeah. even chiropractic manipulation, in theory, you could potentially hurt a patient by doing something, right? They have a yeah. dislocation neck, you do something, you can uh, cause, you know, spinal cord compression, very, very rare, but theoretically even that can happen. But the benefit of chiropractic treatment far outweighs that small risk, so you do it. Same thing with the uh, injection. Can it potentially harm a patient? Yes, it's a very low risk. The harm does go up the more and more of them you do. Uh, but if, that, if the choice is that versus surgery, statistically speaking, chance of complication with surgery is far greater than, than an injection. So if somebody can feel better with injection and avoid surgery, yes, you expose them to that risk, so you can feel guilty for that, but you're also not feeling guilty because potentially they're not do, getting surgery. Yeah. Because I can okay. do that, you know, so that, that surgeon should have also acknowledged that, you know, he himself has probably at some point caused the dural tear 
by himself or caused some kind of nerve damage or caused some kind of an infection or caused a muscle dehiscent or bone fracture from doing surgery as well. All those are real risks. We still do the surgery because those risks are still fairly rare. So we realize that they exist. We warn the patient about them, but the chance of those risks happening pretty small. Chance of them feeling better after surgery is 90%. So it's, the risks is justified by the benefits. So same thing with this. So, okay. Yeah, it's possible, but very rare. Very good. Thanks. All right. Uh, let me get back to this. All right. So, and that gets us to surgery. So surgeries for lumbar disc herniation, basically the goal of the surgery is to get the pressure off the nerve. Uh, once you get the pressure off the nerve, it typically starts working better. You, the pain goes away, the um, neurologic deficits go away. So microdiscectomy or hemilaminotomy is probably one of the more common uh, surgeries we do for that. Laminectomy is a little bit more invasive, a little bit more thorough. I'm not sure at this point, you know, proportion-wise, how many hemilaminotomies versus laminectomies are being done. Both are very common procedures. I'm not sure which one is more common. Uh, but basically, you access the spinal canal by removing part of a lamina, which is why it's called laminotomy. You're creating a hole in the lamina, uh, and you remove the herniated portion of the disc. Success rate in terms of the patient actually feeling better is about 90 to 95 percent. Uh, there is a chance that the disc may re-herniate. You now have a hole through which the disc escape. Most of the time, that hole seals up with scar tissue and it becomes fairly structural again. Sometimes it still it remains a weak spot. So lifetime, on average, at the patient, there's a 10 percent chance they will get another disc herniation in the same spot. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, and that's really not kind of a side effect of the surgery, it's just side effect of the fact that the disc has herniated, especially if the disc herniation was large in size, the more of the disc has actually escaped and is now no longer between the bones, the less properly the disc will work because the rest of the disc is not whole anymore. Part of the cushioning material that was in the disc is gone. The rest of the cushioning material, therefore, will be overuse, so to speak, and will degenerate faster. So once you have a disc herniation, the rest of the disc has a higher likelihood to degenerate earlier than life than it would have been had it not herniated. So hemilaminotomy or microdiscectomy, you make a, a linear incision, usually one and a half to two inches in midline. Uh, you cut through lumbar sacral fascia, then you remove the multifidus muscles of the bone. Then you basically create this opening in the bone by removing the ligamental flavum. You access the nerves. Then you can see in this uh, picture on the right side of the screen, you pull the nerves out of the way with some kind of retractor and you use some tools to basically remove the herniated portion of the disc. You leave the rest of the disc intact. I typically reach inside the disc and make sure I don't feel any other loose pieces that might come out. And if they do, I remove them ahead of time, and then you basically close everything up. So uh, you're left with a little opening where the um, lamina was removed, but the rest of the structure of the spine stays fairly intact. Uh, some surgeons use iPod of microscope. I just use my loops that magnify everything two and a half times. To me, that's enough to see what I need to see. Uh, so this is kind of a preoperative and postoperative MRI. On the left side, you see the uh, disc herniation kind of on the left portion of the uh, spinal canal. It it's not very close to the nerves, but it was still causing significant inflammation and the pain down the leg. So on the right side of the screen, you see that lamina, the Y-shaped bone. On the right side of that lamina, there is a little white spot that's just post-operative scar. That's where I drilled out a channel through the bone that moved those dis uh, nerves out of the way and removed the disc. So now you see that disc is no longer there. So in terms of recovery from hemilaminotomy, uh, patients are obviously allowed to mobilize right away. There is no bed rest required. Uh, most of them, especially if it's a younger, healthier patients are done on outpatient uh, um, basis and like a uh, outpatient surgery center. Uh, I typically recommend them limit their physical activity for the first two weeks because we did cut some muscles. You want those muscles to heal up a little bit before you start using them. And then after two weeks, we start physical therapy. Uh, to re-strengthen the um, lumbar um, core muscles as well as improve the range of motion. So in terms of recovery, in two to three months, most patients are back to normal. Um, recovering that muscle function is basically the longest part of that. Uh, typically, there are no permanent precautions for that. Once they're fully recovered, they can return to full function, including heavy duty function, firefighter, police officer, construction work, athlete, things like that. They can return to all of that. 
Uh, in terms of costs, uh, and that's kind of all costs altogether, it's usually between 35 and 45,000. Uh, probably the cheapest surgery we do, uh, as long as it's done in a surgery center, which most of them would be. So then that gets us to lumbar laminectomy. That one is a little bit more thorough. So instead of just making a hole in the lamina, you remove the entire lamina and a spinous process on both sides. Um, so a little bit more invasive, you cut muscles off the bone on both sides instead of just one side. The benefit, you have much greater access to the uh, nerves. You have a lot more room where you can decompress the nerves. Um, so typically this is done for a more severe stenosis where there is a larger disc herniation where you feel like that small opening you get with a hemilaminotomy is not big enough for you to reach and decompress the nerves properly and you need more room to safely decompress the nerve. That's when you do laminectomy. Um, it can be done outpatient as well. It can be done inpatient, really depends on the health of the patient and depends on how much surgery we're doing whether they need a drain or not. If we put a drain in there to prevent hematoma, we usually keep them overnight so we can remove the drain the next day. Um, uh, a lot of patients are concerned, that, well, you're removing the bone from my spine. My spine is not gonna be structurally you know, sound anymore. Why are you doing that? And I explained to the patient, that basically the bone we remove, the lamina is not a structural portion of the spine. It is not responsible for connecting the bones together. It is basically more of a um, where muscles attach to the bone. So as long as we reattach the muscles to each other, the spine should work properly. And I kind of underline if done properly. So there is a way, there is a risk that by doing laminectomy, if we remove too much bone or if we remove too much of a facet joint, we actually will create instability. And now the vertebrae are not connecting very well anymore. Now you have to do fusion surgery to fix it. So that is a potential risk of that surgery. Chance of instability after laminectomy is pretty low. It's less than 1%, but it is one of those things that we warn the patients about. Uh, so this is what a, a you know, pre and post laminectomy MI would look like. This patient had a fairly large disc herniation here at L5S1. You can see it on the left side of the screen. Uh, and then after the surgery, you can see the disc herniation is much smaller. It was removed. Uh, there's a lot more space for the nerves. And now you see all of this post-operative scar tissue that was created by us getting in there and uh, decompressing the nerves. Uh, on the right side of the screen, you see axial images, same thing before and after. So at the top, you see the disc protruding and compressing the nerves in the spinal canal. And then at the bottom, you see there is a big opening and the nerves are no longer compressed. But that Y-shaped bone, this, uh, the lamina is now gone. That's what was removed for us to access that large disc herniation. This discrimination is pretty large. It was in the middle. So if I would have just made a small hemilaminotomy opening, it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for me to reach this whole thing. So I needed a bigger opening to basically access it safely and not injure the nerves in the process. In terms of recovery from laminectomy, same thing. The patient does not need to be on bed rest. They can walk right away. Whether they, this done is an outpatient or inpatient really depends on the patient. This depends if we're doing one level of the uh, laminectomy or two or three, depends on how healthy they are. And also depends if we're gonna be putting a drain in there. Since we're cutting more bone, cutting more muscle, there's a higher chance that will be some residual bleeding and they'll need a drain. If they need a drain, I usually keep them overnight. Uh, in terms of physical therapy activity, same thing. Um, I suture the muscles together. I want those muscles to heal up to each other before they really start bending their back. So I tell them minimal bending, no lifting more than 10 pounds for about two weeks to let the muscles heal back together. And then they start post op rehabilitation. Same thing to work on lumbar range of motion and core strengthening. Recovery from hemilaminotomy versus laminectomy is about the same. Um, it's about two to three months. Most patients are going to be back to normal function. Same thing, normal, no permanent precautions after that surgery. Cost of surgery, this one's a little bit more expensive because it's more thorough. If it's done in the surgery center, usually around 55,000. If you do it in the hospital, the facility fee is the big difference. The hospital facility fees are far greater than surgery centers, so that becomes about $130,000. Uh, if you account all the costs, the surgeon fee, anesthesia, recovery, everything. So, um, and that gets us to lumbar fusion. Why would you wanna do lumbar fusion for spinal stenosis? Most of the time we do not, most of the time a decompression surgery will do. However, in some cases, stenosis can be severe enough that for us to properly decompress the nerves, we need to remove the supporting structures of the spine, which are pars or facet joints. Um, basically, if, this, if the nerve compression is so bad that 
the only way to decompress is to remove those supporting structures. If I remove the facet joints, well, now the vertebra are not connected together anymore. I just destabilize the spine. So now I have to put everything back together and restabilize it. The only way to do that would be to fuse those bones together. We typically uh, put in hardware to do that. If somebody already has instability and we're doing decompression surgery, we may want to do fusion to make sure it doesn't become too unstable because with the compression surgery, we do remove ligaments, which do help with stability a little bit. Um, and if that's the only thing that kept that patient stable because they're otherwise already, their joints became incompetent, we sometimes would do fusion surgery if there was a pre-existing instability. Um, like I said, most of the time, if you do a fusion surgery, we're gonna put hardware to hold the bones together. Um, they typically require inpatient stay. There are a few places where these are done on outpatient basis, but you really need to have a young, healthy, motivated patient for them to go home the same day. Um, the recovery is a lot longer. Uh, the traditional lumbar fusion surgery has been a very, very invasive procedure with about a liter of blood loss, significant pain, typically five days stay in a hospital. Nowadays, we have a minimally invasive techniques, which allow us to do the surgery through smaller incisions. It is technically more difficult to do, but because we're cutting a lot less muscle and soft tissue while doing it minimally invasive, it's typically a quicker recovery, shorter hospital stay, less pain, lower risk of complications. So um, all of my fusions right now that I do are minimally invasive. So my patients typically stay in a hospital overnight and go home the next day. Uh, blood loss is usually, you know, 50 to 100 cc, so I never need to do blood transfusion of patients. Uh, like I said, it's more technically difficult to do, but it's a lot better for the patient. Success rate, same thing, is about 90%. Most of the people will get much better after um, fusion surgery if it's done for spinal stenosis uh, or instability. Um, but obviously, because it's a bigger surgery, you know, chance of complications is a little bit higher. They're going to have more pain. They're going to have longer recovery. So this is what before and after would look like in terms of fusion. So on the left side of the screen, you see this L4 and L5. There's instability. L4 shifted forward um, on top of L5. And there's a lot of stenosis, a lot of nerve compression in the back. So uh, by doing this minimally fusion surgery, I put in a spacer between the bones and I put screws and rods to hold them together. As you can see, it completely reduced the spondylolisthesis and created a lot more space on the nerves uh, for the nerves uh, in the back as well. And this would be before and after MRI. As you can see here, the spinal stenosis, especially off to the sides, is bad enough where um, I either have to remove the disc and distract everything, or I would have to remove those facet joints for me to properly decompress the nerves. Just laminectomy would not be sufficient in this case. But after the fusion surgery, as you can see, the spinal canal on the right side of the screen is much larger. There's a lot more space for the nerves. That patient's leg pain went away. And that's kind of the difference between traditional open surgery versus minimal invasive surgery. So I know it's a gross picture, uh, but on the left side of the screen, that's basically what a traditional open lumbar fusion would look like. You have to cut a lot of muscle. You have to lose a lot of blood for you to be able to put the hardware in there properly and to see everything. But with the newer um, minimal invasive techniques, we can do exactly the same thing, but now we're doing it through two uh, one and a half inch incision on either side of the spine instead of in the midline. And when the incision is healed, instead of a four and a half long incision in the middle, you have two uh, inch and a half long incisions on the sides. Um, you know, to patients, the cosmesis kind of matters to me. It's more, I didn't destroy the soft tissues in, inside, so they recover faster, lower bleeding, lower complication rate. In terms of recovery from fusion surgery, uh, it will depend a lot on whether it's done open or minimal invasive. With minimal invasive surgery, the way I do it, they're still allowed to walk around the same day, no bed rest required. Um, in terms of decreased physical activity, it's a little bit longer for about six weeks, and we actually put them in the brace. The brace is just kind of from their belly button to their pelvis to stabilize the spine. Uh, so uh, the muscles will heal up, and that's for about first six weeks. So no bending, no twisting, no lifting more than 10 pounds for the first six weeks. After that, the brace comes off and they do physical therapy, uh, uh, once again, to work on lumbar range motion and core strengthening. Recovery with minimal invasive surgery is usually between three and six months. With a traditional open surgery, because a lot more cutting is done, it's a little bit longer. It's usually six to 12 months. The problem with fusion surgery, once you fuse one level together, that means the levels above and below have to move more to compensate. So they will wear and tear faster. And at some point in their life, they will develop what's called adjacent segment degeneration, and they may need additional surgery in the future just because we did this surgery. 
uh, obviously it becomes a lot more expensive surgery. There's hardware involved, it's a hospital stay, um, it's a longer surgery. So the costs when done in the hospital are anywhere between $400,000 and $500,000 um, currently by you know, today's prices. All right, um, and uh, just for the kind of completion, uh, completeness sake, I would mention the other causes of stenosis. Like I said, some patients have congenital stenosis. They're just born with a narrower canal. So this MRI you see on the right side of the screen is somebody with um, uh, basically a narrower canal all the way through the lumbar spine. The significance of that uh, is if somebody already has congenital stenosis by itself is typically not symptomatic but it means that there's so little room, redundant room left around the nerves. Even a small disc herniation can cause a lot of nerve compression because there's not that much redundant space to begin with. Um, you can have what's called epidural lipomatosis, which is overgrowth of fat tissue inside the spinal canal. Most of the time it's asymptomatic, but I have seen that cause symptoms. And once again, it's kind of a pre-existing narrowing. So a smaller disc herniation will cause a lot more problems if somebody already has epidural lipomatosis and removing that redundant fat tissue actually helps them a lot. Uh, trauma, if you have a broken bone and the bone has protruded into the spinal canal, obviously that can cause nerve compression. Those are high energy, severe uh, injuries. Most of the time you will have some irreversible neurologic damage, even with the most timely uh, treatment, just because this is a lot more energy imparted into the nerves than just from a simple disc herniation. And then the last but not least, and basically the most rare, is you can have tumors growing around the ins inside the spine. The tumor can compress the nerves and cause neurologic damage. Obviously, you would need to operate on that to get the pressure off the nerves. And on top of that, obviously, you need to deal with whatever else that tumor is causing. Most of the tumors in the spine are metastatic, meaning they have a primary tumor somewhere else, like a lung, and it's spread to the spine. So not only need to treat the spine, but need to treat the rest of the lung can uh, cancer as well. And that's pretty much it.